Welcome to another presentation in our series, Rereading Revelation. We have come to pre presentation number 21, uh, and we are reading this book through in a search of its vision of healing. This is another presentation on the thousand years that are described in Revelation uh, chapter 20. So this will be part two of that presentation. And it would be good to, to uh, review a, a couple of things from part one. <clears throat> so we read at the beginning of this chapter that Satan is going to be confined. And we see that the, this is quite muscular action on the part of the angel that comes down from heaven. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and locked and sealed it over him, so that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. So these verbs are very robust verbs. So the action seems very decisive, and we asked in the previous presentation, why didn't they do that before? If you can do it now, why not before? And then we toned it down, that all this action is an example of hyperbole, because Satan isn't bound by a chain, he is bound by circumstances. That's quite a different, different thing. And then we looked at this <coughs> picture by Ansel Kiefer uh, of a desolate earth made desolate by Satan, who is now bound. And in some ways he is confined in an earth he himself made desolate. And in the text, background text in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 20, it's, uh, there is God addressing <coughs> the fallen star. You have destroyed your land. You have killed your people. So that's the dynamic here, and, and it's a coherent vision. And let this painting be a sort of <coughs> evoke what we are looking at. So <coughs> we are breaking a little now from the, from the sequence in chapter 20 to look a little more at these terms, and especially the term ancient serpent. So when we read, when we started out in chapter 12, uh, we have read this before, I'll read it again, the, dra the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the slanderer, Ho Diabolos, and the adversary, Ho Satanas, the deceiver of the whole world, it should say there. And then we jump down to chapter 20, and we have read that, uh, sent, uh, that verse already, but here we can see, uh, see the action again. He sees the dragon, and now we are just interested in these terms, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. So what to make of these terms and what to make of what is going to happen in the remainder of these texts in Revelation 20. <clears throat> this is William Blake's illustration of the angel that comes with a chain and a key and seizes the serpent. So you can see this is strong muscular action, quite a stretch away from the action we have said uh, or hinted at now that he is really bound by circumstances. <clears throat> so the storyline then, to follow it here, so we are looking now at this segment here really, that in chapter 12, Satan falls, he is expelled from heaven, and there is an allusion to the beginning of the story here in Isaiah 14, and then we have mention of the serpent. So there is the fallen star, the serpent, they seem to, they go together. And then at the end of the story here from chapter 12 to chapter 20, Satan is bound and released. And he is remembered as the ancient serpent. So 
This is not to distract from the fact that this event precedes in time what is described upstream here up to chapter 4. So another way of representing this is to, to put it as beginning here and ending here. That Satan falls here in the story, fallen star, and then serpent here in the beginning of the Bible. And here at the end, then Satan is bound and released, that strange, and remembered as the ancient serpent. So we have the ending of the Bible somehow feeding off the story in the beginning of the Bible. We must not lose that, that, that connection that the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation serve as bookends. They are the story that ends in Revelation is the story that began in Genesis. That seems to be clear. So I'm going to look at a, at a painting here for a moment. I have mentioned Lucas Cranach before, and we have said that he lived on the same street as Martin Luther and was a contemporary of Martin Luther, and he loved to paint this scene in Genesis, especially the scene of temptation here in the middle of the picture. I think there is close to 40 some paintings in various uh, museums in the world. I have collected, I have a file with all, most of those paintings. Uh, this one is found in the uh, Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna in, in, uh, in Austria in the main uh, art museum there. And you can see here <coughs> Adam is created. Here Eve is created from Adam's rib. Here we assume that this is God instructing uh, Adam and Eve about the terms of their existence. Here the serpent with a human form, speech uh, uh, talks to them and they eat of the tree. Here they hide from God behind this bush. And here there is expulsion from paradise and the all-seeing eye of God is <coughs> looking at all of this. But we are going to look at one specific scene, so I will magnify up uh, this detail in the picture and <coughs> take us to the ancient serpent, that's Revelation's term, and the serpent, that's the term in Genesis. And we read that the serpent was more shrewd than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? meaning no tree, and then we hear that and we wish to hear it keenly uh, with sensitivity. And then we hear later, we read, then, uh, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So here is the deception and here is her saying that I was deceived. And maybe some people, or many people, tend to think that she's just making up stuff. She's just sort of giving, giving cheap excuses. But that is probably not a good way. She was deceived. So <coughs> that's, that might just be, be true. It's not the whole story. She, maybe she should not have been deceived. That's another matter. And this <clears throat> to sort of make the serpent a human figure, even with someone feminine characteristics. That's what Cranach has done in this painting. In other paintings, he has the serpent as just a serpent. So let's do a bit of musing or thinking on this in Genesis. And I <clears throat> will ask three questions. Is the story in Genesis existentially and theologically significant? Should one take it seriously? That's the first one. And then, is the serpent's question theologically significant and consequential? That is to say, what the serpent 
says about God? Is that, is that uh, on target? Does it, does it accomplish something? That, uh, that's another of our questions. And then, will the encounter in the garden at the beginning of the Bible shed light on the course of events in Revelation? That is really the main thing to see if what comes to light in that story in Genesis to in some, it in some sense has explanatory power for what happens, this strange turn of events in chapter 20 in Revelation. So what's my proposal or answer to this? Yes, it is existentially and theologically significant. Yes, the question the content of the question is theologically significant and consequential. And the beginning does shed light on the ending. <clears throat> so before we look again and look at various variant translations of what the serpent says, let's just position ourselves inside the creation story and remember a few things such as in chapter 1, that God looks at what he creates day after day after day, verse 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, and 25, and God said, it was good. And then the last day, it was very good. So we have the notion here, we have Genesis sort of saying over and over that what God created was good. So when the serpent comes and says something wasn't good, that is a sort of problematic. Genesis has not prepared us for that. And then we look at another scene here. This is in chapter 2, <coughs> that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. And here I have translated it a little different, but <coughs> that's just to to broaden the terms here, to cultivate and protect it. That God entrusts a huge responsibility to human beings. This is not like, you know, God babysitting humans and saying, well, you know, don't do that, you know, don't touch that. He is really giving humans a huge mandate and, and giving uh, humans uh, a significance. So this is generous, it was good, and this is generous too, in a way. God as a generous God. And then we have this, <coughs> this one thing that isn't good. But, <coughs> so God says, it is not good that the man should be alone. So there is a not good, even from the perspective of God. But that is the not good of discovery. And God will make it good by creating Eve here from the side of Adam. And in some ways, God allowing a human relationship in some ways to be competitive, to allow something to happen in the human sphere that might just even risk putting God a little more to the margin. You, you, you can see that. So, but it will be good. What isn't good in God's eyes here is made good by the fact that God does create Eve. So now everything is good. And then <coughs> we read on about <coughs> the divine command that God gives a command. And that's what, what uh, the serpent will, will seize upon. <coughs> So the God, we're reading this now, and the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall die the death. This is a very literal translation, but it's, no, it's worth saying that whatever is implied in the consequences of dying the death, the certainty that death will follow, we should not think of it as an imposed penalty. We should Im 
uh, read it as a certainty that that it was not a good idea to eat of the tree to 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 think that that would be to to their advantage so most readers hear this a certain way they hear a tone of prohibition here sort of accent it with a prohibitive uh, tenor in my book god of sense and traditions of nonsense where i deal in quite some depth with key biblical narratives i have a chapter on the story of adam and eve and i feature three other ways of reading that story and i cannot do that this in detail i will just list them that the accent should be on permission not on prohibition that there is a kind of yes it is a test of sorts but if you figure this one out there is a kind of promotion in it a kind of opportunity to become more mature so it is not a negative to have the tree there it is a positive and then there is this very tantalizing thing that the tree is there for their protection that there is danger in the world and the tree in some ways is signaling the, a real danger and God alerting them to that danger that is assuming that the serpent and the Satan figure precedes these events so I will just in all humility <coughs> refer you to to that book or other I think other texts that deal with that story the experts have read this <coughs> because there are uh, uh, nuances in the translation of this text and these names are some of the biggest and keenest readers of uh, Old Testament texts and so <coughs> here is Gunkel who is saying somewhat you know accenting the unreasonable thing about the command that the tenor here is did God really say that that command was unreasonable and thus an unwelcome restriction and then there is uh, Skinner who said who is not framing it as a question the serpent is not saying did God say he is saying God said but it is clearly with the sense that that doesn't really really make sense that is not good so this is a kind of half so half interrogative and half exclamatory sense and here again moberly is it true that god has said it better not be true or this one by robert alter who is one of the keen linguists and who have now translated the entire new old testament but all by himself he's a professor in california at berkeley uh, just a, a wonderful linguist and his translation of the old testament is really really worth looking at he he translated though god has said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden and then he lets the sentence hang sort of a hang there in the air so again god has said it but it was not a good thing that God should say such a thing. <clears throat> and the comments are of these same people, or some of the same people are like this. Very subtly, the serpent does not explicitly invite her to eat. Why don't you eat? He doesn't say that. He understands the art of seduction. He leads her on to sort of make her a shareholder in what he wants her to do. And then this one by uh, Martin Buber, Martin Buber, who is the towering Jewish scholar of the 20th century. The serpent speaks as though it knew very imprecisely what it obviously knows very precisely. The serpent knows the answer to his own question, but he wants to destabilize her. He wants to deconstruct what is in in her mind and then this one by skinner it is a half interrogative 
half reflective exclamation as if the serpent had brooded long over the paradox and had been driven to an unwelcome conclusion. I've thought very hard about this, that God has actually said such a thing. I don't like to think that way about God, but evidence compels me to think that way. That is the idea here. And two more. What matters here is not that the serpent's words are obviously false, but that they imply that a total prohibition is the sort of unreasonable prohibition that one might expect from God. So, so here it is. So, again, the accent is on prohibition. Even if you scale back the pro prohibition and say that not all the trees were prohibited, just one tree, the residue is that that is also unreasonable. And then <coughs> uh, this one is a good conclusion, excellent conclusion, I think. <coughs> but however one may translate chapter 3, verse 1b, it is clear from the text that the notion of the goodness and generosity of God is seriously damaged. It is a pretty successful, successful charge. And I have shown this illustration before, a trajectory here that runs from misrepresentation of God through distrust and then to, yes, transgression and then to fear. And here is how I would like to sum it up or add it up, <coughs> that in the serpent's uh, innuendo, in the serpent's question, he says, there is a generosity deficit in God. God is not a giving person. He holds things back. Even though Genesis has said God gave and God made and God did and it was good, it isn't so good here. God is not a giving person. And then we could say that this is another side. These two are very closely related. There is a freedom deficit. God is more interested in prohibition, in restriction, than in freedom. And here we go, and they are now eating of the tree. <coughs> so, just make a comment here about a new friend I have, and I do, I'm very proud to call her a friend. Her name is Bettina Stangnet. She is a philosopher in Germany. She lives in Hamburg. She has written <coughs> many books, and she has written a very influential book about Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the great Nazi uh, criminals. And I met her uh, a while ago, and she gave me generously of her time, and she gave me some of her books <coughs> that were, she has written about the phenomenon of lying. And she has in some ways laid out the philosophy of lying. Let me just share a couple of things because the serpent is not telling the truth in the Garden of Eden. That's certain on the face of it. God had said, you may freely eat of all the trees. And the serpent says, has God said, you cannot eat of any tree. <clears throat> so, so that is misquoting God at the very least. Bettina Stangnet says that lying is a demanding intellectual activity. Someone who lies has to invest in it and do something to persuade a person, another one, of something that is demonstrably not true. And then she says, <coughs> for a lie to do damage, it has to be believed. And this is really relevant in our time when there is quite a lot of fake news and fake versions of reality. And it is quite amazing that Low quality lies, lies of a very, very, uh, what should, uh, yes, let me say just low quality, still seem to, to find an audience, to be believed. <clears throat> but this is part of, this is how it begins. She is not commenting on the story in Genesis. That's what I'm using her work to, to do. But I will say, in light of what she has written about the subject, that the serpent's lie was a high-quality lie. It was not easy to resist it. 
And it was hard to refute it once it was believed. How do you refute it? How do you sort of restore, uh, restore um, uh, the reputation of the person whose reputation has been destroyed? It was hard to refute, I say. Or what? Because you need to refute it? Can't you just sort of wipe it out? Can't you just... The hardness of refuting it is if you are in some ways, as God seems to be, limiting yourself in how you wish to address the lie. If the means, if the sort of remedial means is just that you need to tell the truth and keep on telling the truth and keep on telling the truth till you have successfully defeated the lie, that you cannot defeat the lie by any other means than truth-telling, not by force, not by some other way. So, perspective in the Gospel of John <coughs> is very similar to the book of Revelation on this point, and I think it is helpful here in the middle of John, or, or the f first half of John, Jesus says something quite harsh, but he is talking about, about Satan, he's talking about the devil. You are from your father, the devil. He says, that's not to incriminate the people, it's not an attack on the people, it is really a comment on the devil, and want to do the wishes of your father. That one was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there isn't truth in him. Whenever he speaks as he is wont, he speaks the lie. For he is a liar and the father of the lie. And the lie in, jo in the Gospel of John, here is the lie in Genesis. The lie that we said, God is not a given, giving person, God is not generous, and God is not interested in freedom. Those are the two two elements in this lie. And note that the Genesis makes it one singular lie, the lie. That is what how Jesus talks about. And then we have later in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaking, now is the critical moment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be expelled or exposed. This one. He is the one. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. I will fix it. I will defeat the lie. That's what he's doing. And then, how does he do it? He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The lamb killed with violence in the book of Revelation, and the person speaking here about expelling and exposing the father of the lie, that comes in the same theological territory. And I ask, is the person who is willing to die in this story, is he a giving person? The serpent said, God is not a giving person. And Jesus comes into the world and what does he do? He is revealing the kind of person God is in the Gospel of John and in the book of Revelation. And God turns out to be a giving person. <coughs> We are back now in Revelation 20. <coughs> we need to finish this off. And let's <coughs> read on. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for war. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They are many. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So Satan is unchanged and he is out there to deceive and he is out there to make war. So, and here we see his re uh, release from prison. <coughs> so, how are we going to configure this last battle? Well, we are going to begin with the ending of this verse. So, just to take it from the ending of this passage, so let's uh, add it up. 
I'm not asking you to believe anything that isn't in the text. All of this is in the text that we have read. The beloved city is the new Jerusalem, newly descended from heaven. That's the setting. It is a city of people, because the text says it's the camp of the saints, the holy city, the beloved city is the camp of the saints. And then, number three, circumstances for a, another battle. That is to say, if Satan was t wanted to, were to make another battle earlier, he couldn't do it, because there is no, no one to fight. Circumst the circumstances for a battle were not in place until this, until the descent of the city, the, city, the people. But now the circumstances are right for a battle. And this feeds into the notion that he was bound by circumstances and not by some external force applied to him. Satan deploys his favored means. He goes forth to deceive and to gather them for war. And that has been the mantra throughout the book of Revelation, beginning in that central chapter 12. And then we have Gog and Magog. They are in the, mentioned in this passage, and there is an uh, Old Testament antecedent for that. And then we read <coughs> this text, that fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the eagerness of readers to read nothing else in this text is remarkable. The eagerness of readers or of the theological tradition not to explore other options for how to read this text is also remarkable. Eagerness to read it as a literal event and eagerness to make the most of it to some extent jeopardizing the corrective that this book brings to bear on the whole story. So <clears throat> let us look now. So the option that God is actively destroying the hostile forces, that God is actually burning them up or burning them alive. I wish to, to contest that impression, that reading tradition, and say that what we are witnessing here outside the city is really an implosion. It is something that collapses on itself. And I want to, to take some Old Testament texts to feed into that, and also Revelation texts to, to corroborate that view. Here is the text from uh, the Gog and Magog in Ezekiel that I have mentioned earlier. I will summon the sword against Gog in all my mountains, says the Lord. The swords of all will be against their comrades. So the army here start fighting among themselves. They defeat themselves. That's what we mean by implosion. And here is a text from Ezekiel about the covering cherub, which is another image for Satan in the Old Testament. And here he is in the end, he finishes, and the text says, I made fire come out from within you. It destroyed you. Not destruction from a fire coming from outside, but destroyed from a fire coming from the inside. And Moshe Greenberg, who is one of the keenest readers of Ezekiel in our time, he says, fire from your midst signifies evil causing its own destruction. And then we have these texts from Revelations. Witness destruction in the trumpet sequence at the hand of the fallen star three times with fire and smoke and sulfur. So that is in the armamentarium of the bad side. And then we have in Revelation 17, the constellation of evil powers depicted in Revelation 17. How do they uh, come to an end? Destruction by fire from within. They will devour her, her flesh and burn her up with fire. This is not God doing it. It is something that happens inside that constellation. 
And then we have read about terrifying carnage outside the city in Revelation 14, 12, where the wine press was trod outside the city and blood was pouring forth all the way to the bridles of the horses for about 1600 stadia. These are terrifying scenes of carnage happening in the ranks of the opposing side. And then we see <coughs> the Lamb and the holy angels as witnesses to this scene and not as perpetrators. So <coughs> I'd like to, to uh, put these two texts next to each other just to, uh, to uh, make sure that we are not omitting any resource. Here we saw these very uh, strong verbs, seized, bound, through, locked, sealed. The language is very forceful, but the meaning is not so forceful. This is not coercive, the coercive binding of Satan. It is Satan bound by circumstances. But the language is the language of hyperbole, intentional exaggeration. And this is a very good text to take home and to sort of recognize that Revelation is into hyperbole. It exaggerates for a reason. And then we have this text. I have lots of people who are willing to read this text with me as hyperbole and to do the sort of circumstances. But the same people are quite eager to do this, make this text literal. Fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they, were, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. To sort of, that's not quite literal, this is quite literal. So let's, <coughs> let's uh, uh, feed a couple of more things into it, and then I have a conclusion after this slide. This text we have read before. I have tweaked it out a little now just to, to get the full advantage of the self-destruction that first Enoch uh, writes about here. It's similar to the scenes of destruction in Revelation, especially the verse in Revelation 14, 20. In those days, the father will be beaten together with his sons in one place, and brothers shall fall together with their friends in death until a stream shall flow with their blood. So this is carnage again. For a man shall not be able to withhold his hand from his sons, nor from his son's sons in order to kill them. So here, in the most intimate of relations, there is now, there is now uh, 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 adversarial things going on, and, and yes, there is killing. Nor is it possible for the sinner to withhold his hands from his honored brother. Wow! From dawn to the sun, until the sun sets, they shall slay each other. That's the vision of this final battle in the first Enoch. The horse shall walk through the blood of sinners up to his chest, like in Revelation 14.20, and the chariot shall sink down up to its top. So here is adding it up. Speech and meaning in the book of Revelation. Hyperbole in the binding and release of Satan and many other texts too, but also in the two witnesses in Revelation 11.5, the two witnesses and fire goes out from their mouth and kill all their enemies, but it, it's language, it's not what really happens. It's hyperbole. And then there is uh, the option of metaphor, which is not the same as hyperbole. Metaphor is a figure of speech. <coughs> is not my word like fire. That's the Old Testament, very strong on that. So you can have fire here in, in uh, also in a sort of hyperbolic sense and also as metaphor. And then you have some background text in Genesis. This is the destruction of Sodom by fire. This is a description of Edom suffering fire or smoke, the smoke ascends forever and ever. And here is, 
Jude in the New Testament writing about the destruction of Sodom uh, as an example of the eternal fire. So you have Im imagery here for destruction and I have tried to show that this is not destruction caused by God. So <clears throat> I want to, uh, I think this might be my, I might have one more slide but I want to take you here for a short visit. This is the arrival scene in Auschwitz. It's quite familiar. Many of you have seen it more sort of at right angles. And this is one of my visits here. And here I am looking at one area of Birkenau. Birkenau is a huge, huge area with all these barracks. Uh, and here you see that much of it has collapsed, but you can imagine what it was like. And you see the, the fences and the, and, the, and the barbed wire there. And now I'm looking at a, at a, a map, at a, a sketch of what these areas looked like. And you can see the barracks here, row upon row of barracks separated by uh, fences. And then I'm going to hone in on this one. This is area 2B in uh, Auschwitz. Where, and this one, I'm going to magnify it even more. And <coughs> this is 2B. This was the family camp. Family camp in Auschwitz were Jews <coughs> that had been transported from Auschwitz, uh, from uh, Theresienstadt in, in the Czech Republic. They came and came as families here and they lived in that camp as families for six months. Father and mother and children and the children went to school and they participated in, in uh, uh, plays and they even sang Beethoven's Ninth Symphony there or they performed Beethoven's Ninth, Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy and the whole thing. So one of the people who survived this is the Jewish historian Otto Dov Kulka. And late in life, he wrote a book that I think is one of the most remarkable books written on the subject. So <clears throat> I'm reading from his book, Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death, written late in his life. He says that we were there and we were performing plays. Our group presented heavenly Auschwitz, earthly Auschwitz. That was the title of their performance. As newcomers in heaven, of all places, we discovered to our astonishment that in the world on high, there were selections and there were crematoria. So the earthly Auschwitz and its horrors had a counterpoint in a sort of eschatological final Auschwitz where there would be selections and crematoria. I say in my book God of Sense and Traditions of Nonsense that the, uh, these notions of hell and God burning people alive that notion is not viable anymore in just downstream from Auschwitz. But the book of Revelation has been the book that has in some ways nourished that kind of theology and made a sort of heavenly Auschwitz a tenet of Christian belief. I have as strongly as I can in this series tried to counter that narrative because there is no way you can make this book a vision of healing if the notion of heavenly Auschwitz persists. That is not doable. So <clears throat> here is how I did this in my dissertation and this is my final slide and I thank you for hanging in there with me on this <clears throat> very demanding but also very important topic. When I came to St. Andrews and wrote my dissertation, the title of my dissertation was Saving God's Reputation, looking at how Christ uh, and the faithfulness of Christ is the key to understanding God's ways in this world. And 
I came to this point, what is the logic when Satan is released? And connecting then that to the story in Genesis. So let me read it. When the voice of the ancient serpent is heard in Genesis, it charges the divine government with a generosity deficit and a freedom deficit. The generosity deficit has been taken care of by God revealed in Christ, giving his life as a generous person, a self-giving person. So that one has been taken care of. What about the freedom deficit? That was also implied in the servant's, serpent's charge. Here is what I will propose for that. It is the logic of freedom that leads to Satan's release. He must be released because he has to work things out in the context of freedom. It is the logic of freedom that leads to Satan's release. And it is within the logic of freedom, precisely the value said to be lacking in God, that Satan proceeds to work his own undoing. So that is a menanding sentence, but there is nothing arbitrary about this. And freedom is the logic that, that takes this to the end. God destroys nothing. It is destroyed inside that logic of freedom that the serpent took the lead in denying. From here on, we will be looking at six visions of healing to cap our series. That will be next time.